Hi friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of December. So today is New Year's Eve. I am in the middle of a few books but I definitely will not be finishing any of them before January. So this is it final wrap up of the year. Uh, lots of exciting end of year videos coming, best of the year lists, stats videos. This is one of my, this is like my favorite time of year. I love making all this stuff. But for today, we are going to be talking about the books that I read in the month of December. I had a really great reading month and I'm looking forward to sharing. For those of you who are new to my wrap ups, the way that I do these is I start by talking about all my stats for the month and then I talk about all the books that I read starting with my DNFs, the books that I didn't finish, my lowest rated books, moving up to my highest rated books. Now for a pretty substantial number of books this month, I've already talked about them in other videos, either in my mid-month wrap up or in my reading vlog. So for those books, I'm just going to show you the book, tell you the star rating, and let you know where you can hear more detailed thoughts on those books. And then I will be covering all the other books that I read in the second half of December. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into my stats. Like I said, I had a really strong reading month and I did a lot of reading, especially in the first half of the month. In December, I read a total of 35 books. This does include some short stories, some novellas, some pretty quick like holiday romance shorts, um, so not everything was super lengthy. In terms of page count, it's a total of 11,633 pages. This does include my audiobooks and that makes an average page count of 375 pages per day, which is pretty similar to what it was in November as well. In December, I DNF'd three books, which is more than usual, but I think especially at the end of the year, if I wasn't loving something, I was kind of like, forget it, <laughs> I'm not gonna read this, which I think you're gonna see in my star ratings because they definitely are skewing higher than they usually would because this month I was like, look, I just want to be reading books I'm enjoying, especially coming up on the holidays, and so that, that was what I did. Like, the vast majority of what I read was things I really enjoyed, and in fact, the only lower rated books that I read, like, almost all, pretty much all of them were in the first half of the month, so if that tells you anything. This month I did not have any rereads. Eleven of the books that I read were either ARCs or books that were sent to me for review. I did not read any translated fiction, I did not read any graphic novels, and this month I read six books by indie authors. And as usual, I did listen to a lot of audiobooks. This month I listened to 16 audiobooks, so almost half of my reading was via audio. Eleven of those books are what I term shelf, which means that I got them off my physical TBR shelf via audiobook, or sometimes it's combined where I was partially listening to the audiobook, sometimes reading along with the physical book. There were a couple of those this month. This month, eight of my audiobooks came from my library. Library has been really, really great this month for audio. Two were from Audible. Three of them were from Scribd. Two of them were audio review copies from NetGalley. And one of them was an influencer review copy from Libra FM. Every month as an influencer, I get a few audiobooks I'm able to download from Libra FM in return for just talking about them here. So if you guys are interested in checking out Libra FM, I do have a link for them down below. It's not sponsored, but I think they're a great service. If you're an audiobook listener, it's nice because the proceeds from Libra FM goes to support local indie bookstores. So check them out down below if you're interested. And uh, this month I did not have any audiobooks from the Volumes app. Okay, moving on, let's talk about the age breakdown. Unsurprisingly, like, we're going with the trend of 2020. This month, 27 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience. Eight of them were targeted at a YA audience, and this month I did not read any middle grade. Okay, moving on, let's talk about publication date. This month, the earliest publication date of anything I read was 1972. I read 15 books that were published prior to 2020. I read 17 2020 releases and I read three 2021 releases. Looking at the diversity of the books that I was reading in December, this month was definitely a little bit lower in terms of percentages than what I usually like to see, but it wasn't terrible. 43% of the books that I read were written by non-white authors and 23% of the books that I read this month were written by queer authors. Usually I like to see that first number hovering closer to 50%, so a little bit lower than usual, but not terrible. And again, it was a lot of just kind of like mood reading, a lot of holiday romances, and it's, it's fine. Okay, next let's look at genre. 
I told you I was reading a lot of holiday romances and so perhaps unsurprisingly by far my most read genre this month was romance. This month 15 of the books that I read were in the romance genre and in terms of specific subgenres eight of those were contemporary romances, five of them were historical romance, and two of them were speculative romance. Then I read nine fantasy novels, two contemporary fiction, two mysteries, two nonfiction, two sci-fi, one horror, one poetry, and one thriller. I was definitely leaning into the fantasy and the romance, especially in Christmas time. I, I kind of just want to be reading things that make me happy, and those are things that make me happy, so uh, a lot of that. Okay, lastly, let's look at my star ratings. I told you <laughs> they were going to skew high and they definitely did. This month I did not give out anything under a two and a half star rating. So if that tells you anything, like things that were going to be under that, I pretty much DNF'd for the most part. I had one book that got two and a half stars, two books got three stars, three books got three and a half stars, nine books got four stars, seven books got four and a half stars, nine books got five stars and this month a whopping four books got six stars and in my personal rating scale a six star read is a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. I had four of them this month. Um, yeah it was a really great reading month. With that said let's go ahead and dive into all the books that I read this month. I will start with my DNFs. This month there were three books that I chose not to finish and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Find Me in Havana by Serena Burdick and The Ballad of Hattie Taylor by Susan Anderson. If you want to hear more details on why I chose not to finish those books check out my mid-month wrap-up which I will link up above. Then in the second half of December I DNFed one book. It was an e-arc that I had from NetGalley and this was kind of a bummer because the the premise was really good but guys like for such an interesting premise this was one of the most boring books <laughs> that I have read in such a long time which is such a bummer. This is The Ruthless Lady's Guide to Wizardry by C.M. Wagner. It's coming out in January and I got 70% of the way into this. I very very rarely DNF things after the 50% mark. I usually am DNFing between like 30 and 50% but this one I got to 70% and I was just like I can't do it anymore. I am bored out of my mind. Like nothing is happening and I don't know how you make such an interesting sounding plot boring but it was so boring. <laughs> it's a historical fantasy with a sapphic relationship. I liked the, the characters. I liked the premise but it was so slow and nothing happened and it was so repetitive and like the minutia I, I was just like bored to tears and I DNF'd it. Um, so yeah that was kind of a bummer. But <laughs> I did finish a lot of books this month so with that said let's go ahead and talk about the books that I did finish. I had one book that got two and a half stars from me this month and it is one I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book is The Frozen Prince by Maxim M. Martineau. Again if you want to hear about this one check out my mid-month wrap-up. And I had two books that got three stars this month. I also talked about both of those in my mid-month wrap-up. So basically what I'm telling you is the lowest rated thing that I finished in the second half of December was three and a half stars. Like it was a fantastic second half of the month. Uh, but the books that I did give three stars to are Curves and Right by Millie Tayden and Hearth and Home by Rebel Carter. If you want to hear thoughts on those check out my mid-month wrap-up. Next for my three and a half star reads I had three of them and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. <laughs> Those books are Song of the Crimson Flower by Julie C. Dow and Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz. Again, check out that mid-month wrap-up if you want to hear more details. I also gave three and a half stars to Lexicon by Max Berry. So I had picked this up on the recommendation of Tori Morrow because I know she really really loved it and I, I don't know this was such a weird trippy book <laughs> and like I it, it took a while for me to process how I felt about it. I ended up writing a pretty lengthy Goodreads review on this one, which my Goodreads is always linked down below and I do write reviews for all of the books that I finish on there. Um, yeah, this was very 
bizarre and I liked the concept I liked a lot of what it was doing here but I did feel like there were some weaknesses in the structural elements of the story um, and I also think I wanted a little bit more from the characters I felt like the characters were sometimes a little flat like I wasn't as invested in them as I wanted to be however if you want like a really trippy sci-fi thriller this might be an interesting one to pick up and so I wouldn't dissuade you from reading it even if it wasn't a perfect book. It basically takes this idea that what if people could learn how to use words and language in a way that affects humanity's subconscious and is able to control them and there's an organization that does this that are called the poets and they can like control people's minds basically with language and I don't want to say much about this because it would be really easy to spoil things but just know that it's like super trippy. Do check content and trigger warnings if you need them. I have some of them in my Goodreads review because there are quite a few. But yeah, this was interesting. I'm glad that I read it, even if I didn't love it, I think as much as Tori did. It was, it was, it was a wild ride. So I gave this one three and a half stars. Then nine of the books that I read this month got four stars and three of them I have talked about in other places. Two of them were in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are off Limits Attraction by J.C. Lee and Return to Virgin River by Robin Carr. So if you want to hear about those two books, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four stars to The Afterlife of Holly Chase by Cynthia Hand. This is a book that I read for my TBR swap vlog that I did with Ashley over at Bookish Realm. This is one of four books that you're going to hear about today that we that I read because she sent them to me. So if you want to hear my thoughts on it, check out that vlog, which I will link up above. I also gave four stars to Lakewood by Megan Giddings. This is a debut horror novel that's really, really interesting. I had heard people talking about it and knew I wanted to read it, and I'm very glad that I did. I see that this is not a perfect book, which is why it's a four star read and not a five star. It is a debut, but I think the ideas here and a lot of what she's doing and the atmosphere and the horror elements are done so well and I'm very excited to see what we're gonna get from Megan Giddings in the future. Basically this premise is playing off of the horror of human experimentation that has happened to marginalized people sometimes by force or without their consent or knowledge things like the Tuskegee project for instance that's a lot of what this is getting at and it's a slow burn for sure if you want like a thriller that's super fast-paced this is not what you're getting it's a very slow burn horror that builds over time and becomes increasingly chilling and disturbing and there ends up being a lot of medical and body horror involved in this. It follows a black woman who loses her grandmother and her mother has health problems and mental health problems and she needs to financially support her mom and so in order to do that she agrees to join this experiment where she will have to live in this town called Lakewood and can't tell anybody about anything that happens to her there while she's under the experimenting and things just get weirder and weirder and creepier and creepier and uh yeah I, th I thought this was very very good it deals with a lot of big issues it does get pretty intense it deals with racism and misogyny and homophobia and generational trauma and oh, man it's it's trippy sometimes but I do think it's very good. I do think sometimes it's a little messy. I mean, it's it's a debut, um, but it's a pretty strong debut. I'm ex again excited to see what else we get from this author, and I did give Lakewood four stars. I think it's worth checking out. I also gave four stars to Survival of the Thickest by Michelle Bateau. This is one of the two nonfiction books that I read this month, and I ended up really enjoying this. I got this from Libra FM. It's a celebrity memoir, which those can be a little bit hit or miss for me. Also, the fact that it's a memoir from a comedian makes it a little hit or miss for me because I'm not really that into comedy. But this ended up being mostly a pleasant surprise, especially in the back half of the memoir. A lot of this was really interesting. She talks about being black, being part of an immigrant family. She talks about being a woman in comedy and being plus size and learning to love her body and dealing with body positivity. And the thing that I think is the strongest point of this book is that later in the book she gets into her struggle with infertility and talks about what it was really like to go through IVF treatments and 
multiple miscarriages and the pain of that physically and emotionally and mentally and then eventually kind of being forced into using a surrogate and the judgment that she faced for that and I think it's a really honest look at all of it I think it's really raw and really good and I love that she's opening up about it because I know a lot of women who've been through some of those things who've been through rounds of IVF and multiple miscarriages and the pain of it and it's often not talked about publicly and so I think that is for sure the strongest part of this memoir but there were other things I enjoyed too. Some of the humor is like not really my deal. There were some things that clearly she pulled from her stand-up routine that I was kind of like uh, okay whatever. But overall I did enjoy it and I gave it four stars. I also gave four stars to a holiday short story that we got from Tessa Dare as a freebie this year. This is called When She Was Naughty and it's very short. You can read it in one sitting. It's like less than 50 pages long but it was so charming. I think if you want a good quick look at what Tessa Dare does and kind of her writing style. This is like quintessential Tessa Dare. It's funny, it's sweet, it's historical. Um, I, th I think this will give you a really good taste of what you might get reading more of her work. And the, the concept behind it is really funny. She basically decided to play with the tradition of the ugly Christmas sweater, but make it Regency. <laughs> So um, like it's a short story so it's all really quick but it's funny and it's sweet. Uh, it follows a young woman who for the whole past year has been kind of trading verbal jabs with this Earl who's got a very cold demeanor and she keeps trying to kind of crack through it and she finally thinks she has the perfect idea. It's Christmas Eve, her family's having a Christmas ball, and she's convinced him, all the men in her family, wear these ugly Christmas waistcoats. Like waistcoats? Waistcoats? Is that how you pronounce it? Anyway but, but like the vest that you would wear with a suit. And so she's given him this vest that has like bobbles and tassels and misshapen snowflakes on it and stuff and he shows up and freaks out. And uh, anyway, it's, it's very funny. It's very cute. It's short and sweet and I just like ate it up. So that one was for sure four stars. I think she's still giving it away for free if you check out her website or you can purchase it on Amazon if you want to do that. Then I also gave four stars to an e-arc of a book that's coming out in January. This is A Lady's Formula for Love by Elizabeth Everett. It's a historical romance, the first in a series, and I think it's a debut actually. And it's a really strong debut I think. Um, but the main character is a woman who's a widow and she runs a secret society for scientifically inclined women. I'm a fan of lady scientists in historical romances. So we have kind of a quirky, really nice and trusting widowed woman who's super into her science and will just get like lost in her work and forget to eat and like doesn't pay attention to her clothes and stuff like that. And a bodyguard. So it's like a bodyguard romance. Um, a guy who's about to retire who's worked as a counter assassin protecting people from assassins who's hired to protect her because she's doing scientific work for the government and uh, they, you know, they end up falling in love. And it's really charming, it's funny, it's sweet. It sometimes gets a little bit like, you know, flowery with the romance at the end of it. Like it's a little over the top, so if you don't like cheesier romance you might not enjoy that part of it. But overall I really enjoyed this one and I gave it four stars. I also gave four stars to the very last thing that I read this year. This one is another holiday short story, this time from Adriana Herrera, and this one is much spicier. It's called Her Night with Santa and the basic idea is what if the currently practicing Santa is a butch lesbian named Chris who has a thing for winged eyeliner and red lipstick. I was like what? Okay I need to download this. It's not very long, it's like 50 pages long basically, but um, it, it's an erotic holiday short story. The other main character is the niece of one of the kings of the Magi who sets her up with a knight to get away at the secret beach house that Santa has in the Dominican Republic and little does she know that Chris after her night of delivering toys to the children will also be there. But the thing you should know about the niece of the King of the Magi is that she's recently left the family toy making business to start her own adult toy making company and so there's like I mean like it is exactly what you would expect. It's so you know it, it's like 70% steamy the rest not. So like it's definitely an erotic short story. Um, 
kind of what you would expect, but I do think that Adriana Herrera does a good job of writing strong characters even in very short stories like this where you want to know more about them, you would want to know more about their relationship. But yeah, I think for what it was, it was well executed. I gave it four stars. And my final four star read of December was Be Dazzled by Ryan Lasala. This is coming out in January and it was sent to me for review from Sourcebooks Fire, so thank you to them. I really enjoyed this. I requested this because I liked Ryan Lasala's debut and this one also sounded like fun. It's pitched as Project Runway Goes to Comic-Con and it does have those elements to it. It deals with cosplay, it deals with first love, and this one is told in a dual timeline narrative. So in the future we have a boy who had had his heart broken from his first real boyfriend and he's entering a cosplay competition with a girl who's one of his best friends and ends up seeing the boyfriend there and so it's there's like the cosplay competition thing but then you also get the backstory of how they first met and fell in love and got together and what went wrong and so it's kind of this dual timeline thing and you're seeing it so it's part romance part coming of age story it's about being a queer teenager and there was a lot that I really liked about this a lot of it is very funny Ryan Lasala has this like very strong voice <laughs> In his books and it's it's hilarious so I really enjoyed this one and I did give it four stars. This month I gave seven books four and a half stars and six of them I've talked about in other videos pretty well. So two of them I talk about in the reading vlog where I actually picked my TBR. The books that I talk about there are Cherishing the Goddess by Lucy Eden that was a four and a half star read and The Right Swipe by Alicia Rye that was also four and a half stars so if you want to hear about either of those books check out that reading vlog. I also gave four and a half stars to Malice by John Gwynn and I have a Secret Santa reading vlog for this one which I'll link up above where I kind of vlog my experience of reading this but I gave it four and a half stars. And then some of these I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. The books that I talked about there are Heart of Obsidian by Nalini Singh, In a Holidays by Christina Lauren, and A Universe of Wishes edited by Danielle Clayton. If you want to hear about those books, check out my mid-month wrap-up. The last book that I gave four and a half stars to and finally finished reading was The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. I had started this back in October and was loving it but realized it was the sort of book where I really needed to be able to give it time and attention. It wasn't the sort of thing where I could multitask while I was reading it because I like I had to be in my feels <laughs> with this book basically. This was very much a feeling book for me and um, yeah I in many ways loved this. I think it's very different from anything that we've gotten from Victoria Schwab in the past. It's very much a character study. It's very slow burn. I think some people were talking about it as a romance and while there is romance in it, it's really not a romance. Like this is really Addie's story. She is a young woman who was born in France in the 1700s and makes a deal with the devil basically for her soul in return for a long life. But the catch is that nobody will ever remember her and she can't leave a mark on the world until one day in like 2014 I think she finally meets a man who remembers her and can remember her name. And like it is so emotional and beautiful and I really really loved so much about this. I had so many feelings while reading it, feelings of nostalgia and it, it's like nostalgia and loss and sadness and hope and love, like so many beautiful things and so many strong emotions with this. I had thought that perhaps it would be one of my favorite books of the year but I ended up landing on four and a half stars because while I really really loved a lot of what it's doing I felt like the ending was not quite what I wanted it to be. I feel like I don't know I, I feel like things got a little tropey. I don't know if that's even the right thing to say but like I wasn't I didn't find the ending to be entirely satisfying and not that I needed things to be wrapped up neatly with like a happy ending with a bow that was not it but for those of you who've read it I I was not satisfied with the 
direction the ending took. Other people disagree with me. Some people love this and it's like a new favorite and they love everything about it. There's also people who really seem not to like this at all, which I get. I think this would not be everybody's cup of tea because it's <laughs> like it's not really what you would expect from Victoria Schwab. But I did think it was really beautiful. I'm happy that I read it. I'll be keeping it on my shelves for sure. And I gave this one four and a half stars. This is going so much faster than it usually does. I think it's because I talked about so many of the books that I read this month in other videos. I only had a total of like 14 to tell you about here. So it's very pleasant. <laughs> like normally this takes me so long to film. Moving on, let's talk about my five star reads. I had nine of them and a bunch of them I talk have talked about other places. Let me see how many. So seven of these I have talked about in other videos. One I talked about in the TBR swap reading vlog video. That book is Heroin by Mindy McGinnis. Again, check out that vlog if you want to hear my thoughts on that book. And then there were several that I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Home for Hurricanes by Nikki Murphy, The Lives of Saints by Lee Bardugo, The Duke and I by Julia Quinn, The Earl's Christmas Pearl by Megan Frampton, The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager, and finally Across the Green Grass Fields by Sean and McGuire. I gave all of those books five stars and talked about them in my mid-month wrap-up, so check out that video if you want to hear more details. I also gave five stars to One by One by Ruth Ware. I really enjoyed this book a lot, and it seems to be hit or miss with people. I think because a lot of people are going into it expecting a thriller, and this really isn't a thriller, it's a mystery, which means it's not super fast-paced, it's much more character-driven, it's slower-paced, it's a slower build, but I really enjoyed it. I I love Ruth Ware's writing. It really works for me and I know it doesn't work for everybody, but at this point she's kind of an auto-read author for me and I'll probably pick up whatever she puts out. This one in particular is an isolated closed circle murder mystery. It follows a group of people who are on a corporate retreat in the Swiss Alps on in like a ski chalet and there's an avalanche and they end up trapped with a killer. People start dying and uh, it's a slow build of tension and you do figure out at some point in the book, like it didn't take me that long to figure out who the killer was or guess and I guessed right, but for me at least that didn't take anything away from the experience of, of the read because even if you know who it is, then you have to be like, wait, but how is this gonna play out? And I thought she did a really great job of playing out that tension and the whole thing from start to finish. So I really enjoyed One by One. I gave it five stars. I also gave five stars to a book that wasn't originally on my TBR, but I was on NetGalley looking at some of the audio arcs that they had available and this popped up not because it's a new book, it's actually not, it's a classic, but because PBS is turning this series into a television show in 2021, they have re-recorded the audiobooks. So this is All Creatures Great and Small by James Harriet. It was published in the 1970s. It's the first book in a series of memoirs of a man who worked as a veterinarian pre-World War II in Yorkshire. It's a rural area in England and he wanted to document the experience of what it was like for animal doctors working in that place and during that time. So he wrote it in the 1970s but the stories in this book, which is the first in the series, took place again like pre World War II. And it was so good. It was so lovely and so charming. And what's funny about what's funny about this is these books were some of my mom's favorite books when I was growing up and I never read them. Look, like maybe this is one of these things where I was just like, oh my mom likes them. I'm not that into books about animals. Like I probably won't. I'm not going to read them. And look, it was so good, you guys. And the thing is, too, is while part of it, yes, is about the animals that he's taking care of, a lot of it is about the people. And he's in this small town with all of these weird, quirky, funny people, and it is filled with so many funny stories that made me laugh out loud, heartwarming stories. Like, it was just so good and so charming. And um, this first book is basically following the time from when he graduates and becomes a vet and gets his first post working for another older veterinarian who is, like, <laughs> very, uh, who's very, like, absent-minded and odd at times, which makes for some really funny stories. But it follows that up until when he marries his wife. 
and I loved this so much that I requested the next book because they had that available for audio on NetGalley as well and I plan on reading that one probably in January and the next book is as he's a young married man. So good, so charming, highly recommend. If you guys haven't checked these out, if you want like a feel-good read, so great. <laughs> I was like so surprised how much I loved it. So easy five stars. With that said, let's talk about my six star reads. Uh, again, six stars is what I give to a book that is a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. And actually this past week I've been in the process of taking all of those six star reads and culling them for my top 20. <laughs> which has been a little bit hard. Two of the books that I'm going to talk about today that I did give six stars to didn't quite make it into my top 20 of the year, but you will see them in my top romance of the year because I loved them a whole lot. I think I ended up giving a total of 28 or 20, no 29. I think I ended up giving a total of 29 books this year, six stars. I read a total of 370 books which is wild. So, you know, whatever the statistics on that are, I can work that out. Let me find out. Okay, so less than 8% of the books that I read this year got a six star rating for me. Um, this month there were four of them, so let's go ahead and talk about those. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is maybe the most surprising of these because I expected to enjoy this, but I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. And part of this is a me thing. This is a book that just like, hit the notes right for me and the tropes right and just was was totally my thing. But this is a holiday novella. It's called Wrapped Up in You by Talia Hibbert. I freaking loved this so much. Um, it is a Kobo exclusive, so I had to download the Kobo app just so that I could read this, but it was free around Christmas season, so I was able to read it for free. And it was so good. It was so good. I mean, I knew, <laughs> I already knew I would enjoy it because I generally like everything that I read from Talia Hibbert, but this might be my favorite thing that I have ever read from her, <laughs> which is so weird to say because it's a novella. But I am just astounded at how even in a short novella form, she was able to hit all of the important points and emotional beats that the story needed. It was so good. It has a prickly, grumpy heroine who's got tons of walls up because she's been hurt in the past, but inside is like ooey gooey and intense, which I love. Like not everybody loves that, but I love prickly heroines so much finding love and it just like made me so happy and I really liked the hero as well he's kind of a cinnamon roll and this is a childhood friends to lovers thing where they've been friends since they were kids they both secretly have kind of had crushes on the other but neither of them thought the other person would ever be into them and the hero has made it big as a movie star in America but they're now stuck together at her grandma's house right before Christmas and it's so good and the angst and the longing is so good <laughs> like I loved this so much um it's definitely less steamy than what you might usually expect from Talia Hibbert this one you get like a, a, a slightly steamy scene at the end in the epilogue but like not really much this is really about the feelings it's much more about the feelings than it is about the like physical side of it but oh, it was so good I loved it so so much um so you can see why it made my six star reads. Highly recommend it if that is the kind of story you like. It's really great. And um, what's funny is there are people in the reviews who didn't like it. Some of them because they didn't like the prickly heroine, which I kind of expected that. Other people who were like, oh, there's too much internal monologue and it's too in their heads. And I'm like, no, that's so good. It's all that angst and the feeling. I want to be in their heads and know what they're thinking. So really depends on your taste. If that is not your thing, you might not enjoy it, but if it is, it's real good. I loved it a whole lot, so easy six stars for me. I also gave six stars to One More for Christmas by Sarah Morgan. I, I loved this. It was so good. Another one that's going to be on my list of favorite romances of the year, for sure. Sarah Morgan 
I feel like really deserves more credit than she gets. She writes romance and so people don't always talk about her in this way, but she does some of the best character work I have ever seen. Her characters are phenomenal. They feel like real people you would meet in the world. They are nuanced, they're complex, they're well fleshed out, they jump off the page, and she does a great job not just with one character or two characters, but with whole families of characters and the relationships between the characters are so good. <laughs> like so good and places where it easily could have been stereotyped it's not and she definitely avoids that here. Obviously One More for Christmas is set around the holidays and this one kind of straddles the line between women's fiction and romance. It does have a romantic plot with one of the characters but it's it's got a lot more going on to, with it. It's also super festive. It feels very very Christmassy. So if you like very Christmassy feeling books, this is a great one to pick up. I think probably my favorite book that I've read from her, but I love a lot of what I've, of, of her books. I just thought this year I was like, you know what, I need to put one of her books on my favorites list because it's so good. This one follows a woman who has been estranged from her two adult daughters because she spent all of her time and focus basically on her career. Like I said, remember, like this could have been a stereotyped thing. It's not, it's nuanced, it's messy, the way that it's handled is so good, but also heartwarming and joyful and hopeful. And so she has an accident that makes her realize, oh, like maybe I'm missing something here and she wants to reconnect with her daughters over the holidays. And they end up in the Scottish Highlands during Christmas time. One of the daughters ends up having a romantic plot. It's, it's so good. So I loved this a whole lot, six stars definitely a favorite romance of the year. It was fantastic. Now for the two that you're actually going to see on my top 20 books of the year. Um, one of the last books that I read in the month of December was The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. I said I was going to read this by the end of the year and I did it. It was great. So I really loved this a lot. I generally love N.K. Jemisin's writing and I wasn't sure how I was going to do with this but based on some reviews I was like okay I think I'm going to love it and I did. I will say that the more familiar you are with New York City the better you're going to do with this book because it is basically this book is two things. I mean it's doing more than that but like two big things. It's a love letter to New York City. But it's also a story that is subverting the racism and misogyny that is found in Lovecraft and co-opting Lovecraftian ideas and elements into a story that is celebrating diversity in all of its forms and tackling big issues like homophobia and racism and gentrification um, among among other things. So I really loved what she's doing with in this book. It's definitely a um, it's definitely a political book more than I think her other, I mean I think all of her books are very political if you're actually reading them but this one because it is set in an alternate modern day New York City is much more obviously political which I don't have a problem with but if that's not your thing you might not like it. It's also very New York-y. <laughs> like I, I loved it. Um, I have now lived in New York City for over four years and I, I felt like she nailed so many things about New York, about the character of the city, about the character of the different boroughs. And if you don't know, New York City is divided up into five boroughs, Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. And in this book, the premise of it is that cities at some point in their development are birthed into living beings through this process. And the city will select people to become its living avatars. Um, so in New York City there are six of these avatars, one for each of the five boroughs and then one for New York City as a whole, and they have to find each other and come together to work to defeat this enemy from a parallel universe that wants to basically destroy New York before it gets going. That That's the basic premise of this book, but the people that she chooses to represent each borough are just like perfection. The way this is written, like this was so good. <laughs> I have a lengthy Goodreads review on it. I gush about it quite a lot and talk in detail about why I love this so much, but I think it's fantastic. I get why it's not necessarily for everybody. If you're not super familiar with New York, if you don't like very political books, if you were expecting more fantasy and you got more sci-fi, because I would argue this is more sci-fi than fantasy. Like it's kind of a crossover, but I'm calling it science fiction. It, it might not be for everyone, but 
I loved it. I think it's great. I gave it six stars. So definitely one of my favorite books of 2020. And finally, the very last book that I'm going to talk about for 2020 is, I would say, the best YA debut of the year. <laughs> and this blew me away. I was like moderately interested in it, but people kept raving about it and kept talking about it. And so I finally was like, okay, I'm going to get a copy from Book of the Month Club. We're going to do this. It's amazing. It blew me away. That is Legend Born by Tracy Dion. <laughs> Guys, this book is so freaking good. And the fact that it's a debut is phenomenal. I cannot wait to see where this book is going. Uh, this has been pitched as a modern retelling of the Arthurian legend, which mm, kind of like yes and no. It's not really a retelling of it, but it does use that mythology as the basis of the magic system and the basis of this secret magical society that exists in the book. I would call this Cassandra Clare meets Octavia Butler. That's like my little personal pitch for it. I think it is so freaking good. <laughs> so good. It's similar to the Shadowhunter books by Cassandra Clare in that there is a secret magical society. There is magic interacting with the real world. There is a lot of twists and turns in the plot. There's killing gross demons. There's like, there's romance. All of those elements feel somewhat akin to what Cassandra Clare is doing, although I would argue they're done better. Uh, I love, Cass I, I love, look, I love Cassandra Clare and I think her writing especially now has gotten better over time, but this is certainly much better than her like first Shadowhunter series, but has some similarities. So I think like you could comp it to that, but it also has some similarities to Octavia Butler in terms of the thematic content that it's dealing with because there is a lot here. This is dealing with generational trauma and grief and racism and microaggressions and even just like the fact that it's centering a black teen girl and letting her do everything from use magic and kick butt to wear a beautiful ball gown. Like it is so good. It's doing so many things and there's so many conversations that are happening in this book and references like yeah it's it, it kind of blew my mind, honestly. Um, so you can definitely expect to see this in my top five books of the year. It's really great. Highly recommend. If you haven't checked it out yet, do yourself a favor and read Legendborn. So there you go. Those are all of the 35 things that I read in December, and that finishes out 2020. Super exciting. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I talked about. And for your question of the day, Tell me about one of your favorite books of the year. What is a book that really stood out to you, that surprised you, that you loved? Um, tell me about it in the comments down below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more, and if you want to support the work of the channel, check out the Patreon linked down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.